The ongoing war in Ukraine has become a crucial testing ground for military equipment from around the world. Among the many contributors to Ukraine's defense, the Nordic countries have supplied an array of advanced military gear that has significantly impacted the battlefield. In this video, we'll explore how these Nordic produced systems have performed in the intense conditions of modern warfare and why the Nordic equipment is often supplied to the best brigades in the Ukrainian armed forces. Before we dive into the specifics of the equipment, let's take a moment to review how much each Nordic nation, excluding Iceland, has contributed to Ukraine, both in terms of GDP percentage and actual monetary support. The trend is quite clear. Denmark has truly gone above and beyond. By June 30th of this year, Denmark was the world's leading country in donations to Ukraine relative to its GDP. They were the first to offer aircraft, delivered their entire fleet of self-propelled artillery, and have likely been Ukraine's most significant ally within the European Parliament. If you end up liking this video, I'd love if you could hit that like button. Now, let's move on to how the Nordic produced equipment has been doing in Ukraine. We're going to start with the likely most successful Swedish donation out of the bunch, namely the CV-90. This vehicle's performance in Ukraine is somewhat shrouded in mystery, but the proof is in the pudding. Russia generally loves to boast whenever they manage to destroy Western equipment, but with the CV-90, there is almost nothing to go on as far as reporting goes. Oryx, widely held as the most reliable reporters of geolocating losses on both sides, have only managed to geoconfirm one destroyed CV-90 out of the nearly two years they have been in Ukraine. It is deployed with the elite 21st Separate Mechanized Brigade in and around Bakhmut, Chasif Yar and Kupyansk, where it's seen months of active deployment and only one confirmed destroyed vehicle. It appears Ukraine have repaired four damaged CV-90 and lost one through capture by Russians. Out of the myriad of AFVs currently in Ukraine, it has the lowest loss rate out of all models, coming in at only 2% confirmed loss so far. It's a testament to its incredible protection, surveillance, and operational stability. To compare, Ukraine have lost 47 geo-located Bradleys out of the total of 190 confirmed delivered, meaning a 25% destroyed rate. The Marder, a German counterpart to the CV-90, runs at about a 10% destroyed rate so far. Sticking to the Swedish contributions to the war, let's move on to the Stridsvag 122. Designed with enhanced armor and firepower, the Stridsvag 122 is built to withstand harsh environments and intense combat. It has proven its worth in Ukraine by providing critical support to ground forces, effectively engaging heavily armored Russian tanks, and have been seen taking on Russia's most advanced tanks with ease. As with the CV-90, these tanks are deployed with the 21st Separate Mechanized Brigade, locally known as the Swedish Brigade. Now, let's compare how it's done in Ukraine, compared with its other Western counterparts. Ukraine received 10 of these tanks back in 2023, and up until now, Oryx have only been able to confirm one tank flat-out destroyed. Ukraine have had to abandon several through damage likely adding to this tally, but it does show that the Stridswagen 122's extra armor does make it better able to resist attacks than its sibling, the Leopard 2. Out of all the main battle tanks delivered to Ukraine, the Swedish variant is the one with the lowest destroyed rate, with 10% confirmed destroyed so far. Before you say it, yes, I know that different brigades are posted in different areas with differing loss rates, but overall, these statistics do at least tell an in-part story of differing destruction rates. Continuing in the lane of Nordic armored vehicles, let's talk about the Finnish donated Patria Pasi series. Finland has provided Ukraine with 36 of these armored personnel carriers. These vehicles offer improved protection and mobility, crucial for safely transporting troops across dangerous terrains and are capable of traversing rivers they are all placed with the elite 36th Separate Marine Brigade, currently operating in Kharkiv, and a spearhead when it comes to kicking the Russians out of Vovchansk. The brigade is famous for a long line of highlight reels about their counter-offensives in Ukraine, often conducted with the ability to sneak over streams and rivers in their passes. As with most APCs in this conflict, the Parsi has seen destruction. Out of the 36 believed delivered so far, Six have been confirmed destroyed, while another five have been damaged and one captured by Russia. 
This leaves us at a 16% destruction rate. Now, let's compare this to two of the main other Western APCs currently operating in Ukraine, the Stryker and M113. As we can see, the destruction rate is fairly similar, with the Posse coming out on top. It is important to note, however, that the Stryker is often assigned to Ukraine's spearhead troops and have mainly seen destruction in Kursk recently. To round off our armored vehicles made in the Nordics currently operating in Ukraine, we'll have to have a look at the Swedish PBV series. When I was in basic training, this Swedish armored vehicle was all the rage, though its hull and armament makes this more of a backline operator. It's still a valuable asset for the Ukrainian armed forces in roles such as ambulances, battle taxis, and as supply runners, but it's not used in active combat. Seeing as the war in Ukraine has evolved into a missile and drone match, it would be silly of me to go deeper into this video without me mentioning the Norwegian-made NASM system. The system is credited with taking down planes, ballistic missiles, and is even rumored to have shut down Russia's most advanced missiles. Voices inside the Ukrainian military tell me that they are deployed in areas where Ukraine doesn't want anything to get through, though it is also likely that Ukraine have utilized the mobile launchers for taking down combat jets too. A further piece of Nordic air defense has been sent by Sweden with the RBS-70 already in operation successfully. The RBS-70 is an extremely advanced man pad, which has been credited with taking down both Su-25 and Ka-52. With an infamous day last August of a tally of several Ka-52 and several jets in just a few hours shortly after its arrival. The system is laser guided, so it offers an option on a battlefield which is littered with electronic warfare systems. Sweden has a vast stockpile of these systems, and even the old 80s and 90s technology is a vital component in pushing Russia's air power back. It has a range of 9 kilometers and is likely one of Ukraine's biggest counters to Russia's combat aircraft and helicopters. Moving on to air assets, the top of the list will have to be the F-16, which contains more components from the Danish Air Force industry than any of the other European F-16 program participant nations. The F-16 proved itself extremely capable as an anti-missile system on the first proper engagement where each of the five aircrafts in Ukraine took down five missiles each, sparing the lives of many civilians. Before you go in the comments and state that the F-16 is bad because one crashed, yes, I know, on average, one of these jets crashes every six months including one crash which killed its pilot during training in the US just last year. For this next aircraft, I'm not 100% sure if the Saab 340 has been delivered to Ukraine or not, but by looking at the operational effectiveness of the Ukrainian Air Force in the Kursk operation, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that either they are, or a NATO is feeding the same kind of data to the F-16 hub. Maybe one of my Swedish friends can confirm if the drills are still ongoing at Swedish airfields. In either case, once these planes are airborne, Ukraine will be able to detect everything in the air over the whole of their country, including low-flying jets and drones. It will be a game-changer. One area in which Nordic equipment has outperformed Russian equipment by a whole lot is in artillery. The big ticket item here is the Swedish-made Archer SPG. It is deployed with the 45th Separate Artillery Brigade, who have operated around Kremina and Chasifyar with the Archer since about May 2024. Out of the eight delivered units, only one has been damaged and repaired so far, showcasing its incredible shoot and scoot tactics. The highlight reels of the 45th, which I sadly can't show due to YouTube combat footage policy, show a devastating system which can fire its whole magazine and move before the shells hit their target. It rightly puts it as one of the most advanced systems in use in Ukraine and gives an enormous edge in counter-battery fire. Exactly what Ukraine needs in a war where they don't have artillery superiority. While it is often hard to figure out what Finland has delivered to Ukraine due to non-disclosure, the arrival of the solid Finnish mortar systems KRH-40 and 92 is confirmed. While these systems aren't as flashy as an archer, a well-placed mortar round from these heavy mortars can do as much damage as a 155mm shell. The Black Hornet Nano is likely the most sophisticated micro-drone on the market and has seen extensive use with special ops teams in Ukraine. Norway and the UK donated these in 2022, and since then Ukrainian special ops teams have deployed them to a number of extremely dangerous missions. 
they're likely the one technology on this list which has seen the most use behind enemy lines in both Russia and the occupied territories. Sweden has an arsenal of anti-tank munitions, like very few other nations on Earth. You may remember early on in the Ukraine war how Russian tanks were taken out with smart ATGMs like the Enlor. Along with it, Sweden and Norway have donated the AT4, the Carl Gustav and the M72 Law, all produced in Sweden and Norway. Moving on to the technological space, Sweden, Norway and Denmark have all donated Nordic radar technology to Ukraine. Sweden and Norway have focused on their co-produced Arthur counter-battery radar, which by all accounts is helping Ukraine win most counter-battery engagements where it is covering, while Denmark has provided a whole host of different Terma radar systems. Furthermore, both Sweden and Norway produce some of the most advanced artillery ammunition in the world. For Norway, it's ram-propelled, while for Sweden it's smart and Excalibur shells. Sweden's smart shells in particular are famed for their precision and we've often seen videos of them taking out two Russian tanks at a time. Norway is also one of Europe's largest producers of artillery shells, with NAMO producing over 100,155 mm shells per year, which is expected to rise to over a million per year, with recent investments from the Norwegian government. The buck doesn't stop at artillery shells for Norway and Sweden, who both deliver missiles and airplane munitions to Ukraine. The Penguin missile, produced in Norway up until the early 2000s, was donated to Ukraine just before the Black Sea Fleet started taking massive losses. It is still by all accounts one of the most effective anti-ship missiles in the world and, together with the RBS anti-ship missiles, its Swedish counterparts, it likely has caused a lot of the damage that has made the Black Sea Fleet near useless as a fighting force. Now let's zoom out a bit to more operational technology. Both Sweden and Finland have aided Ukraine with ISR and surveillance, with ISI and Ericsson playing key roles in Ukraine's battlefield management. ISI have supplied Ukraine with satellite access and Ericsson is helping Ukraine manage their communications. Now let's talk a bit about what I think Ukraine should be asking for from its Nordic partners. First of all, a strengthening of their CV-90 collection is a must, which Sweden and Denmark have already agreed to. Secondly, it would likely be wise for Norway to wade into the long-range missile debate and supply some of their long-range joint strike missile variants to Ukraine. It appears that the US, Germany and UK are afraid of the consequences of deep strikes against Russia. But in my mind, these strikes will be the only long-term solution for the problem with glide bombs. Once one nation allows this, all the others will follow. Norway and Denmark's promise of F-16s need to be delivered now rather than in the future. There's no operational need for this to be delayed other than pilot training. Furthermore, I think Norway needs to step up. The income Norway has received since the start of this war, due to people buying gas and oil from Norway rather than Russia, far outstrips the 2.4 billion euros they've given in aid so far. If the argument is that Norway is afraid of inflation, they need to look outside of Norway for equipment and gear. They're the richest country of the bunch and can afford more. That's not to say that I don't think Norway has been a good ally. They're still in the top 10 of countries per GDP donated, but there's certainly some spare change lying around. In conclusion, the proof of the technological edge that Nordic military equipment has over other equipment shows that with proper investment and priority, the Nordics should be able to take a much larger part of the NATO market for equipment. A stronger cooperation between the Nordics would likely be a very good idea and they need to be at the forefront of supporting Ukraine. They have the democratic liberal values to show for and by aiding Ukraine in their struggle for the same liberties, they'll likely secure an ally for years to come. Lastly, I'd love to hear your feedback. Please let me know in the comments below if you think I missed out on something. And as always, I'd love if you hit those like and subscribe buttons. Have a good one, folks.